we left it the last time. So we looked at the star model. So we started working on the star model. So first we derived this virtual balance, which is just a potential volatility balance. And then we looked at the uh, Stoner model. The, the, uh, this virtual balance was just a, a balance between the input of vorticity by the wind stress and the change in uh, planetary vorticity f through beta. And that we've seen that will in, induce a meridional flow in the interior. Okay? But then Stommel came along and he said, okay, so you can derive again the uh, surge balance here. And then he said, okay, but then the input of what is at the surface should be balanced somewhere else. For example, through bottom friction. So he developed a top Ekman layer, he developed a bottom Ekman layer with bottom friction. And that should be a part of the balance um, between the input of the the surface. And so he gave this expression where you have the curl of the wind stress on the right hand side, which is giving you what is to the surface. And that is balanced by a uh, linear drag or what well, could be Rayleigh friction at the bottom through a parameter r that we'll see today a lot. Okay, and the uh, vorticity of the geostrophic flow in the interior, which is setting up the bottom Ekman one layer. Then we've seen that you can define a stream function, and so you can write the Stommel model through a stream function this way. Okay. And so the contribution of Stommel so far is the addition of a linear bottom drag that is balancing the input of momentum at the surface. Okay, and this is what you get as the uh, depth integrated stream function in virtual balance with some linear drag. You see that something is missing on the western side and we'll see how you can get a more realistic solution of the uh, vertically integrated flow given some momentum at the surface. You can derive the same through a homogeneous model instead of vertically integrated. You just start with the shallow water equation you derive the uh, PV equation, which is just this, for a constant h, you arrive to this expression. Okay? And you can plug in again the stream function, and you get this, which is the full Stommel problem, which is time dependent. You've got some d by t here, and you have no linear terms there in the, adve the advective nonlinear terms. Of course, you can go back and get just the uh, no linear model without time dependency and you can remove the advective terms and just get back to the uh, linear standard model. Okay, so... Response to an input of vorticity, so how is the interior of the ocean responding? Is it changing? It's relative vorticity, so it's changing, so spinning faster or, or slower on itself, or is it actually changing by changing the planetary vorticity? Okay. So you can do a scale analysis here. You got u square over l square and bu, and the scale between the relative vorticity and the advection of planetary vorticity is given by this beta Rossby number. Okay. So now you've got another dimensional number, beta Rossby number. And we've seen that for the large scale interior flow, where the velocity is very small and the horizontal scale of the geostrophic flow is very large, that beta Rossby number is very, very small. So you can neglect changes in relative vorticity. So that means that for the interior flow, where the horizontal scale is very large and velocity is very small, what will balance the input of vorticity at the surface is going to be changes in planetary vorticity, not changes in relative. On the contrary, if you look at a frontal zone or a boundary layer, which is what we're going to look at today, there the horizontal scale is much smaller and the velocity are much larger. Therefore, the beta Rossby number is big and you cannot neglect changes in relative vorticity. So you might expect in boundary layers relative vorticity to change. So you need change in relative vorticity in order to balance the input of vorticity. 
at the surface by the wind stress. So we see already here that there's going to be an interior solution and a boundary layer solution. Right? The interior solution will change planetary vorticity and the boundary layer will change relative vorticity. Okay, so we're going to derive the two solutions today. The interior solution, which is we know already is the Svenger balance. And then we're going to derive the uh, boundary layer solution. And then we'll match the two. And get a full solution, which is going to be given by the interior solution and the boundary layer solution. Okay, so you have the Stormer model with some wind stress at the surface minus a linear drag at the bottom. Okay. So when can you neglect friction? You can neglect friction when the uh, frictional effects are much smaller than the changes in planetary vorticity which is what we've seen before with the uh, beta Rosby number. So when, when the uh, linear drag is much smaller than the changes in beta, then frictional effects can be neglected. And we can define now a number, which is F naught delta over H, where delta is the thickness Delta is the thickness of the bottom Ekman layer. Okay? You can actually see this because you can use, you can go back to the, uh, we've derived this uh, in primitive equations. So the Stoner model, you can replace the string function with the pressure field. So we, we've seen this the last time. So you can write the Stommel problem in terms of pressure, and so you can see the geostrophic velocities here. So you can write R as F naught D over H. So you can go back here and see that F naught delta over H, and this is U over L, this must be much smaller as a scale analysis than beta u. Okay. Or, so this is r. r must be r over l, it must be much smaller than beta. Okay, so the frictional effects must be much smaller than beta. Okay, so in this case, when you can neglect frictional effects, then the Stoner problem reduces to just the balance between the wind stress curl at the surface and, and the change in planetary vorticity, which is just this virtual balance. So the interior solution, it's easy. Okay, so a physical interpretation. So the interior solution we know is going to be a balance between the Winston's curve and the change in planetary vorticity, because we can neglect frictional effects in the interior. So a physical interpretation of this, you can look at this schematic. Okay. So you have in blue the wind stress, the typical wind stress in the North Atlantic or North Pacific. Okay. When you can actually focus on the um, subtropical regions here, okay, where you have the westerlies and then the trade. So this is just cut in half. When you have this kind of wind stress pattern or wind stress curl, 
Then you will have, within the Ekman layer, which is roughly 50 meters or a little bit more, then you will have, we are in the northern hemisphere, you have Ekman transport to the right and Ekman transport to the right. You will have a convergence towards the center, and then Ekman downwelling of water. Okay? So at some point, you imagine this, this is a vertical integrated model or it's a homogeneous model. So at some point you imagine there is a level of no motion or a bottom, okay? So you have this Ekman downwelling pushing down this isopic null or, for example, thermocline. Okay. So that vertical velocity induced by Ekman is trying to squash down that column of water. So this column of water below the thermocline has been squashed, and so it will either, in order to conserve angular momentum, it will either reduce its relative vorticity or reduce planet vorticity. And we've seen that in the interior, relative vorticity is not going to change. So what the water will do is change its planet vorticity in order to conserve angular momentum. And in order to change its planetary vorticity and diminish its planetary vorticity, it will travel towards the equator. Okay. Here we have north, so north pole, let's say towards here, there's the equator. So you squash down the column, the column in order to conserve angular momentum will start, will either change its relative vorticity or change its planetary vorticity. It's not going to be spinning less is going to change F, and so it's moving towards the equator. If you have the opposite case, so instead of being an isotropical gyre, you're in a subpolar gyre, where the wind stress pattern is actually anti-clockwise. So in this case, you have Ekman divergence, and you have Ekman upwell. So the thermocline is actually being lift up. So the column is being stretched, it would either spin faster, you know, the conservable momentum, so increase relative vorticity, or increase planetary vorticity. It's not going to increase relative vorticity, what it's going to do is increase planetary vorticity, so move to the north. So there's Verjup transport, so the flow is Verjup balance, in this case it's going to move towards the equator, and here it's going to move towards the pole, in the interior of the basin. So all the, uh, all, the, all the theory that we are developing is for a typical, well, you, you'll see that is for a typical subtropical gyre, just for convenience. It could be for a subpolar gyre, and you get, instead of V towards the equator, you get V towards the pole. It's the same. Okay, so there's a, there's an explanation about that. And so you can take your Stoneman model for the interior, which is just this value balance, and you can start integrating your string function. And so you're going to integrate from uh, um, x equal x east. So you're integrating from the east of the basin, where you assume that the string function is equal to zero. And then you integrate from the east, and you start integrating towards the west, your wind stress curve. Okay? So you just need the information of the wind stress curve, and then you can integrate your string function and get this solution. Okay? Where psi, the string function, as a boundary condition, is given to be zero here on the east, and then you start integrating towards the west. But obviously there is something missing there. Okay? All these streamlines, they heat the west coast and is not realistic. Okay? Something something has to close the streamlines and the stream function okay? in order to have a conservation of mass there. Okay, so if you see here in this in this calculation, it doesn't go all the way to the South Pole. It stops here, where you have the tip of South America. And that's because in this simple value balance, you need a boundary condition somewhere at, e, at x equal 
the East Coast and start integrating from there. If you go south of South America, there's a band of latitude where there is no land. So you cannot integrate this virtual balance with a binary condition of being zero somewhere and then start integrating. Okay. You need some meridional boundary in order to integrate this equation. So the uh, virtual balance doesn't hold in the southern hemisphere. Something else must be in place in order to balance the input of momentum. So it's virtual balance. It's not working unless you have a boundary. There's an explanation for that. Okay. So this is simple. This is the interior, which is just in special balance. And now we're going to look for the solution for the boundary, which is a little bit more tricky. So we said already that the, in the interior, the balance is, is between the Winston's curve and changing planetary rotation. In boundary layers, the balance will be between input rotation and relative rotation. Okay. So relative rotation cannot be neglected. The frictional effects cannot be neglected. And so there must be a boundary layer somewhere, and it's going to be either on the east or on the west. We don't know. So we'll see a mathematical solution and then what makes physical sense. There's going to be a boundary layer somewhere where the flow will return. Okay. In this choice, we've set a swing function to be zero at the east and then integrating towards the west. So in this case, you would imagine that a boundary layer would be on the west. But we could have chosen the stream function to be equal to zero on the west and start integrating towards the east. Okay. This is just a, a choice. So there must be a boundary layer somewhere on the east or on the west. And we'll see what is the, uh, the only physical solution, which you know already. Okay, so we take the full standard model. And we consider a simple square basing. really a square, but it's supposed to be a square, okay. of some size L. Okay. And now we're going to rescale all our variables, given this square domain. So we can rescale x as L x, y as L y, uh, tau is going to be tau naught tau and the string function of psi is going to be tau naught over beta psi hat Sorry, mistake. okay your psi which is to be tau over beta and so we rescale these variables where all the um, all the hat that variables are not dimensional and they are order one so we're trying to work on a square domain of size L, and we rescale all our variables given that square domain. So now we use those rescale variables in the Stoner model. At some point I will drop all the tildes. Curl of Okay, just substituting the variables with the risk of variables. Right. 
Yes, do this. Okay. okay. Or you can write this as tau minus r eta l. Okay, just substitute in a little bit. Now we have a parameter that I cancel. It was that small parameter epsilon equal r over beta l, this. Okay. And we've said that this has to be much smaller than 1 in order to uh, neglect frictional effects. Okay. So using this small parameter, we can look for a full solution which is given by an interior solution and a boundary layer correction. Okay, so we're going to look for solutions that are given by an interior solution where frictional effects can be neglected and this is much more than one. And a boundary layer solutions where this small number is not a small number anymore, but frictional effects have to be taken into consideration. So this is the uh, solutions that we are aiming for. First we'll look for the interior solution, and then we'll look for the uh, boundary layer correction. We know already what the interior solution is, which is there, okay? But we're going to look for the boundary layer solution as well. So the interior, it's easy, we've just done it. And it's when this is much smaller than one, because frictional effects can be neglected. And so the interior solution is just this vertical balance, okay? So if this is much smaller than one, we can neglect frictional effects. And we go back to the interior solution. You can integrate into a solution from 0 to x the curve of tau in this plus some function, arbitrary function g okay, if you do the integration of that Okay. You can write it back in terms of velocities because we've defined the stream function as velocity. Right? U is d by the x of psi and, and v is d by the y of psi. And so if you use a definition for the stream function, you know that the interior where you don't velocity is just a curve of tau. And so and the uh, Zone of velocity is curl of tau d by the x minus of g of y. Okay, so those are the expression for the velocities going back from the string function to the velocities. So now we want to get an analytical solution of this. So we're going to give a simple curl, simple expression for the curl so that we can work easily on, uh, on this solution. Right? So we're going to say that tau y is equal to 0 and tau x is equal to minus cosine of y, okay? just to make things simpler. So this means that the curl vanishes at 0 and, and y. So it's going to be something like this. 
the zone of least stress has a shape like this, tau y is equal to zero, and that wind stress will produce a curl. Okay, so we're going to use this. The curl of this tau is obviously minus pi sine pi y. Okay. So this is the curl that we're going to give to the interior solution, what to the uh, to the um, to the wind driven jar, just for simplicity. Okay, so we can put that curl into the interior solution. function in, in order to make some prog progress analytically, but we're going to say that that arbitrary function g has this function. Okay. Because we're working with a curl, and so I just define my arbitrary function g to be some function c equal g over the curl, because I want to make it a function of the curve. And now I can substitute and so my interior solution is going to be, so we're starting from here, it's going to be x minus pi of Plus, I have to substitute my arbitrary function g, so it's going to be c a function of y, curl of tau. Okay? I'm just rewriting the arbitrary function the way I defined. But we know what the curl is. minus pi of sine of pi y, so there's a plus there. There's a mistake in the numbers. So now I have just this function c, and depending on c, I can satisfy boundary conditions. So I want to satisfy the boundary condition, as we have seen before, that psi equals 0 at equals zero. Okay. So how can I satisfy that? I can have so x is equal to zero. So I have pi sine of pi y equal to zero. And this is happening if c is Write this as x. So y is x. Okay, 
and just rearrange things. So this is x pi. Okay, pi of c is half pi y, and this is minus x pi is half pi y. So how can the stream function be equal to zero at x equals zero? Well, it depends on c. Okay, so if c is equal to zero, then you get pi sine of pi y. Or you can satisfy the boundary condition if c is equal to 1. And in this case, you have You want to make the string function equal to zero. You can do that at x equals zero. And you can do that at x equals zero. So this is zero if c is equal to zero. Okay. Or you can satisfy the boundary condition of psi equals zero at x equal one. And so if x is equal to one, you get this. And this is zero if c is equal to so you have two possible solutions, but you don't know yet which one you want to choose. But you can always satisfy one, okay? because you're, it's a first order differential equation, so you have one boundary condition. Okay, so we'll see that. We'll have to choose one of the two. Okay, so you have these two possibilities, in fact, okay? Given the wind stress that we are providing to the system, which was something like this, providing a wind stress curl, this is providing a negative input of vorticity, okay? And so the flow, the meridional velocity here is going to be negative towards the equator. So in both solutions, you have those black arrows going towards the equator, because beta in the interior solution will respond by changing planet and vorticity. So you're squashing with this wind stress curl, you're squashing the water column, it's not going to change the relative vorticity, it's going to change planet and vorticity. And in order to balance, it's going to move towards the equator. And so you have those black arrows going towards the equator. And those lines are the streamlines of this stream function. So the interior solution will have a boundary condition of psi equals zero, the one we've seen before. And it could be a x equals zero or it could be a x equal one. We don't know which one is the right one yet. So you could choose psi equals zero here and integrate as the picture in colors that we've seen before. Or you could choose psi equals zero here and integrate. Okay? And in this case, we'll put the boundary layer correction here on the west. And in this case, we will put the boundary correction here on the east. Okay? So both are mathematically valid. We could choose either of these two boundary conditions. Okay? Both are giving you the correct transport in the interior towards the equator, okay. but there will be a return flow here on the west to conserve mass and close these streamlines, or there will be a return flow on the east in the boundary condition. Okay. But only one is valid. Okay. We'll see why only one of the two is valid, but we know already that in the boundary layer there will be a change in relative 
So, in this case, the uh, input of momentum is negative okay, into the flow because of the Winston's curl. And in the interior, what you're doing is changing planetary vorticity. In the boundary layer, you're changing relative vorticity. So you might imagine that the change in relative vorticity on the boundary layer will try to balance the input of vorticity in the center. Okay. So if you have a boundary layer here or there, and you imagine that there's a flow, so here the flow is directed towards the equator, and there will be a return flow either on the west or the east. So if the return flow is on the east, you have given frictional effects, you have friction with the boundary, and so you will have, depending on the boundary condition that you choose, let's say zero velocity at the border, and then velocity increasing towards the center. In this case, relative vorticity is going to be the same sign as the input of vorticity from the wind stress. So there's no way a boundary layer on the east can balance the vorticity given by the wind stress. Okay. The vorticity given by the wind stress is negative, and the relative vorticity given by the boundary layer here is also putting some negative vorticity to the flow. So the two will never balance each other. If instead you put a boundary layer on the west, so this is negative, this is negative, and this is actually positive. Right? So relative vorticity on the west can actually balance the input of vorticity by the wind stress. Okay. This is just an intuitive reason of why we will prefer the left hand example than the right hand example okay. through vorticity balance arguments. But in principle, we still don't know which one. We still don't know where we want to put our boundary condition for the interior, either at x equals 0 or at x equals 1. So mathematically, we still don't have uh, a solution. Okay, so now we can go back to the, uh, this is the interior solution, we still don't know where to put the boundary condition, but now we can work on the uh, boundary layer solution, remember that psi was psi interior plus the boundary layer correction, okay. this is the interior solution, but we still don't know where to put the boundary condition. Now we can work on the, uh, on the boundary layer correction. And we still don't know if the boundary is at the uh, x equals 0 or x equals 1. So the boundary is very small. Okay, so this is supposed to be much smaller than the interior. And what we're going to do is, very, in, in a very simple way, asymptotic matching of the two solutions, of the interior solution and the boundary layer correction. So because the uh, horizontal scale here is very small, what we're going to do is stretch the horizontal coordinate x and work on the boundary layer with the stretch coordinates. So the boundary could be an x equals 0 or it could be an x equal 1. We don't know. Okay. And so we can stretch the coordinate this way so that the new stretch coordinate alpha is 0 when x is equal to 0. Or we can stretch the horizontal coordinate alpha this way so that alpha is 0 when x is equal to 1. And now we're going to work on a stretch coordinate alpha here in the boundary layer. We will see why. Okay, and epsilon is again a small parameter, similar, but well actually is the same as the epsilon that we derived. So now we can go back to the um, 
the uh, Stoner model, and we're going to use the stretch coordinates. So psi is the interior plus the boundary layer correction. This was the uh, frictional effect. And the curve of tau is left on the right hand side. Okay. I just moved the uh, frictional effect on the left. stretch coordinates for the uh, boundary correction this is what you get okay so psi is not a function of x anymore now we have psi which is a function of alpha and y And so you get this new expression for the stretch coordinate in the boundary layer correction. So you can now So this, the interior solution is in value balance. Okay. So this is just equal to the curl of tau because that's in value balance. So now the solution that is left is this plus. If you work on this. in the notes anyway. Okay, I've just expanded the Laplacian here. This way. Okay, and that's because the interior solution is in value balance and so we're left with this for the uh, for the uh, uh, boundary correction. So here we have epsilon s, which was the small number that we derived before, and this epsilon now, which is this small number of the stretch code. We make the obvious assumption that the two are the same. And so now we have two terms that are really balancing each other. So they really know the balance is given by these two numbers, these two terms, okay? Because this, this is 1 over epsilon squared, this is 1 over epsilon, so these two are big because epsilon is a small number, okay? Whereas this is multiplied by epsilon and this one is also multiplied by epsilon, so they're small numbers. So the leading order balance is between these two terms. Okay, so we're left with these two terms. Only the other bounds in the boundary layer correction. And the solution to this is, is a standard one. This is 1 over epsilon and this is 1 over epsilon. Yes. So they're big. There's epsilon. Yes, this was 1 over epsilon squared. Mm -hmm. So now it's 1 over epsilon. Uh, 
Okay, so this is the standard solution to the equation. Now, what this solution says is that the uh, solution of the boundary layer grows exponentially in the uh, negative direction of alpha. Okay, when alpha is negative, this is positive, and it grows exponentially. But the solution cannot grow exponentially into the interior because we said that in the interior the boundary layer correction is small, is neglected. So this is, well now it's a stretch coordinate. Okay. So we have the basin and we don't know where to put the boundary layer correction. We don't know if we have to put it on the west or if we have to put it on the east. So this is saying that the solution is growing exponentially in the uh, negative direction of alpha. And that cannot happen into the interior solution. So we choose two things in order to make it realistic. So we say that alpha is positive. Okay, so this is negative. And then we say that A is equal to zero. So we're left with B e to the minus alpha, and alpha is positive. Okay. So, if we now have to choose where to put the boundary and the stretch coordinate, if we put our x equals zero, we have x equal epsilon alpha, and if we put it at x equal 1, we have x minus 1 epsilon alpha, right? And remember that alpha is positive. So, as alpha grows, you have a decaying solution for the boundary layer correction. Okay. If you put the uh, stretch coordinate on the west, where x equal epsilon alpha, when alpha grows, x grows, and the solution decays. So this is fine. If you put it on the other side, as x diminishes, alpha decreases, and this would actually go. Okay. So that solution would grow into the interior solution, which is this. Okay. But we said that the solution cannot grow into the interior because otherwise the boundary layer correction would be large as we approach the interior, which is the opposite of what we just said. So, what we really want is to put the boundary correction on the west so that the boundary correction exponentially decays as alpha grows and becomes negligible approaching the interior. Okay. So, in the interior, frictional effects are not felt, we are in spectral balance. As we move into the boundary layer, then the uh, boundary layer correction becomes more and more important exponentially. So we really want to put the stretch boundary condition and to put the boundary layer correction on the west because it's the only one satisfying our conditions so far. And so we know already that the boundary layer correction would be on the west and there would be a western boundary layer. Okay, so this is just a mathematical solution for it. So if you remember the... Uh, the interior solution correction, we had two choices, c equals 0 or c equals 1. c equals 0 would put the boundary condition for the interior at x equals 0, but we have the boundary layer there, so we don't want that anymore. Now we want the uh, boundary condition to be at x equals 1, where you have the interior, and then you have the western boundary correction. 
And so between C equals 0 and C equals 1, what we choose is C equals 1. Okay? Both were valid, but now that we have chosen to put our boundary condition on the west, because it's the only one matching the condition that frictional effects are small in the interior, then if we put the western boundary condition here, then we have to put psi interior equals 0 at x equal 1. So we choose c equal 1. Okay, so if we choose c equal 1, then the solution is psi 1 minus x sine of pi y. Okay, that's if you choose c equal 1. And this satisfies the eastern boundary condition of psi equals 0 at x equal 1. What now this that we have decided alpha to be positive and A to be zero? Now B will have to satisfy the other boundary condition of the West. Okay, so the total is given by this. Okay. So at uh, x equal one. The stream function is equal to zero and is given by this. There is no boundary layer correction contribution. On the west, this has to be zero at x equals zero. And that will be uh, that boundary condition will be provided by B. Okay, so at x equals zero, what we have is psi pi of sine of pi y. Okay, because this is zero. Plus the boundary correction equal to zero. Or sine of pi y plus the beta y because you have the boundary condition at x equals 0. When x equals 0, this is 1, and you're left with b. So that's v. OK. So obviously, given this, you know that b is minus So B is simply minus this. And so the boundary condition, phi, now you can write it in full, phi is going to be B minus pi sine pi y e to the minus alpha is x over epsilon. So that's the boundary layer correction fee. So if you remember the expression for the wind stress curl was just minus pi sine of pi y. So what we've seen is that the uh, the Zvedrup, the interior is a Zvedrup balance and is proportional to the curl. Okay, obviously the curl of the wind stress is giving you the input of vorticity. And the interior solution is responding by changing finite and vorticity. And then you have a boundary layer correction where you want to conserve so here you have a curl of the wind stress and you have 
for the wind stress curl. You have asymmetric balance towards the equator. Now we know that there's going to be a boundary layer correction on the west, okay, which is balancing, if you think about conservation of mass, all the flow that is going to the south here will have to return to the west on the boundary layer. And so it makes sense that the, uh, so this is psi, okay, not here. So it makes sense that the uh, boundary layer correction is also proportional to the wind stress curl because the wind stress curl is what is generating the interior solution. And this has to balance the interior solution mass transport. So it will have to be proportional to the wind stress curl as well. So if you know the wind stress curl, you know the interior solution, and you also know the boundary layer correction, which is ultimately uh, correlated to the interior solution. But what you don't know yet is the width of the, uh, of the boundary layer correction here in delta. Let's, let's see this here. Let's see, I've added this schematic as well to the notes. So, let's display this. So, the boundary correction is this, okay? So, it's proportional to the Winston's curl in the interior of the flow because it will have to balance that input of electricity. So now you can write the two things together. So the total transport in the wind-driven gyre is going to be the interior solution, which is this virtual balance, plus the boundary layer correction, which now we know as this. Okay. We've decided mathematically and physically that the boundary layer correction has to be in the west and that the boundary layer correction is proportional to the Winston's curve. So you write the interior solution, which was this, plus the boundary layer correction, which is this. Okay. You rearrange terms and you get this. Remember that we're working with a-dimensional uh, variables. Okay. We had set variables to be x equals L, x hat, y equal L, y hat, and so on. So we're a dimensional. So you can go back to dimensional uh, variables and to get a dimensional solution. So if you go back to x and y and not the uh, x hat and y hat, you can rewrite the total stream function to be like this. Yes? If it so happens that the is really deep and touches both ends. You mean there is no boundary at the other end? But let's put that we have a boundary at either end. If it happens to touch the continent of the planet. I understand the question. What's the solution? We only have the boundary at. We have psi equals zero here. No boundary? No. Psi is equal to zero. That's the boundary condition. Psi is equal to zero, and then you start integrating. Is what you've seen here. Okay. Those black lines, you start integrating from the east, where you say that psi is equal to zero, at x equal one, and then you integrate your solution towards the west. You're doing Uh, from that image. If the boundary is, is at the extreme 
west, right? There's no boundary solution here yet. This is just this virtual yeah. balance. I'm, I'm, I'm anticipating that, for example, the boundary is on the west side. Here there's no boundary. I mean, if, if one is to put the boundary to the extreme west. If you want to put a boundary, you put it on the west, yes. And we've seen it why. Because physically and mathematically, it makes sense to have it on the west. So what, what, what the solution looks like there is this. So your function is equal to 0 here, and you start integrating to the west. So what if it were touching the surface here on at the the east end would not have any boundary. At the east, you don't have any boundary. You have the interior solution, then you start your stream function. The boundary condition is equal to zero. You don't have any boundary layer where frictional effects are important. You just say that the stream function is equal to zero, and then you start integrating. There's no boundary. You just have one boundary condition. You put it on the east and you start integrating towards the interior. And then you hit the western boundary. Then you hit the western side of the basin. And that doesn't make any sense physically. There must be something to close, to close the streamlines. And that is the boundary layer that we're adding later. So, uh, so physically, this what happens? Gyres do not touch the eastern boundaries. So, so this is the full solution in um, in dimensional variables. And if you look at the solution now, four point nine. Well, now if you integrate this numerically, this very very simple model of the wind-driven gyre. A full solution with an interior west, uh, an interior solution is vegetal balance and a boundary layer. If you integrate this equation numerically, given this kind of wind stress, you get this. Okay, this is not reality. Okay, there are many things missing, but you have an interior flow towards the equator, given that wind stress curl, and you have a return flow at the boundary on the west. You see how the streamlines are all squashed here, meaning that the velocity here on the west are much larger than the velocities at the center, at the interior. And if you define your boundary layer somewhere here, you will see that the total mass transport here is balancing and is equal to the total mass transport there for mass conservation, of course. If you have all the Zverjup interior going to the south, you will need to bring the same kind of water, amount of water, to the north. And that would be on the western boundary. That's why the Gulf Stream is relatively narrow, but it's a very strong current, because it's taking back to the north all the water that is going towards the equator of the interior, just by conservation. Okay. So what is the boundary layer width? You might ask yourself, what is this delta? Okay, so we said that in the interior, this is much smaller than beta, so the relative vorticity is much smaller than beta. Right? So changes in relative vorticity are much smaller than changes in f. And we define this number r, so this means that f delta over hl must be much smaller than beta. And so for friction to be small, you have this epsilon number r over l beta much smaller than 1, or r over beta much smaller than l which makes sense. So in the interior, where L is the horizontal scale of digital velocity, is very large, and R is friction. So in order for friction to be small, the interior has to be very large, and the frictional effects must be very small. Okay. So in this case, you can neglect the frictional effects, and you go to the interior solution. But when L becomes smaller, and now you are in the boundary layer. So now the horizontal, the horizontal scale of the motion is small, and so you are within the boundary layer. 
then r over beta is similar to l. Now you're considering horizontal motions that, are, that have small horizontal scales. So for example, you're here, and here you cannot say that l is much larger than friction. It's actually comparable. Okay? And so in that case, l is now the width of the uh, boundary layer, and so delta is r over beta. Okay. So this r over beta is actually the width of the boundary layer. And it makes sense that the boundary layer is a function of friction. Right? The larger the friction, the larger the width. Okay. So obviously, in a simple model, numerically, r is a parameter. You just choose your parameter, and you will get a boundary layer that is going to be wider or narrower. That depends on the numerical parameter that you give to R. Then you try to tune the parameter R in order to get a boundary layer that is physically relevant to the uh, feature that you're trying to reproduce. Okay. So now, if you use this more complete model, very simplified, but more complete model, where the stream function now has an interior solution and a boundary layer correction in the west, and you choose a boundary layer width of 100 kilometers, that's by choice, just because it's close to reality, and then you integrate your stream function, now you get a picture like this, which is quite different from the picture that we got previously just with this virtual bounds. But at least now we see how the uh, streamlines are actually closed on the western side. They don't go into the, uh, into the continent. And you see how the center, for example here, the center of the dry is squashed towards the west. It's not in the center. The center of the gyre is not in the center of the basin. The center of the gyre is squashed towards the west because we have a boundary layer on the west and an interior solution on the east. So all of this is my interior solution and my boundary correction is roughly here and I've chosen to give to the boundary layer a width of 100 kilometers or so. So now this is much closer to reality, still a simplified version of the wind-driven jars, of course, we're missing many, many features. But this is already, at least it's closing, it's, it's conserving mass and it's closing the streamlines and it's much closer to reality. It's giving you a western intensification and it's giving you a nice interior transport in its virtual balance. Again, this is vertically integrated or for a homogeneous option, which is not, which is not realistic but it's getting closer to reality. Okay. I'll stop here. I'm not starting. Any more questions? Yes.